My name is Jason Bowman. I'm an enrolled agent specializing primarily in IRS collections representation. Uh, and I've spent most of the past seven years working on payroll tax representation in particular. Today's webinar is generously sponsored by Gusto, formerly Zen Payroll. And with us today, we happen to have Jake from Gusto. He is uh, joining us on the webinar. And so, Jake, we definitely appreciate you uh, being here. Uh, I'd like to give you a moment to introduce yourself, uh, tell folks, uh, you know, just kind of the big picture overview of, of what Gusto can do for them. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Definitely appreciate it. Definitely a pleasure to be here. Always fun working with you and, and your team over at CPE Suite, definitely appreciate you partnering with us for this webinar. Um, clearly happy to be here. Uh, in terms of uh, who I am, just kind of set the stage, my name is Jake Hafner. I'm a California CPA. I work here at Gusto, again, formerly Zen Payroll, on our partner advising team. So I work with accountants, uh, people in a position to either offer payroll or uh, work with clients for in payroll uh, in some capacity, and so I spend most of my day working with clients and, and different partners and uh, helping them uh, determine how it makes the most sense in terms of being most efficient with payroll and how that works with their practice. So uh, who is Gusto? Uh, we are a full-service payroll benefits and workers' comp provider. Uh, we are on a mission to help companies put people first. Uh, we currently work with over uh, 2,000 different accounting firms across the nation, including 50% of the CPA practice advisors, 40 under 40, and we are also working with tens of thousands of small businesses. So um, you can see this up on the slide here. Last year we won CPA practice advisors 2015 Reader's Choice Award. Um, you know, we're definitely on a mission to really change the whole ecosystem and and happy to, to be here again today to give you guys a little more information. Thanks, Jake. I, I appreciate that. Uh, our course objectives for today are to discuss the enforcement priorities that are put out there by the Small Business Self-Employed Division of the IRS. Uh, these are the folks that I am most used to working with um, in regards to representation. Uh, revenue officers out in the field, uh, the field collection personnel, uh, SBSC is the division that they all work for. We're also going to discuss employer payroll tax responsibilities, uh, of which there are many, many. Uh, we're going to take a look at payroll tax related penalties, uh, as well as one of my personal favorite subjects, the trust fund recovery penalty assessment process. Uh, we won't have time to get into defenses against the trust fund recovery penalty assessment, but I thought it was important on this webinar to at least cover the assessment process so that you have a good idea of what that looks like. So first of all, uh, SBSE enforcement priorities. Uh, obviously, the vast majority of businesses and individuals, they all comply with their payroll tax obligations. For the majority of your clients, this is not a problem. Uh, they either have all their ducks in a row, that's why they come to you, obviously, but uh, every once in a while, there are businesses that get into trouble. Uh, with the IRS, and it's because they uh, aren't making their federal tax deposits, which is one of the responsibilities uh, for employers that we'll talk about here in a moment. This is a tremendous uh, enforcement priority for SBSE, that division of the IRS, uh, and I want to, um, I think it's important for folks to understand why this is so important. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a Treasury Daily Statement. Uh, if you are not familiar with these, uh, and if you are in any way a nerd like I am uh, when it comes to the financial operation of the federal government, then uh, start checking these out. They're published every business day uh, on the uh, Treasury.gov website. Uh, this is just a, a random day that I pulled up on, on the day that uh, I was putting together the, this part of the presentation, the, the PowerPoint slides. Uh, so this is from November 18th. And uh, what you can see here uh, that I've highlighted in yellow uh, are 
the inputs and the withdrawals from the Treasury Department. The interesting thing when you look at these numbers, uh, a, a significant chunk of the daily operations of the U.S. government are funded by increases in debt. Uh, this is something that we're all uh, painfully aware of and that the media obviously uh, loves to talk about. Uh, the other aspect of this, though, that the media doesn't talk about is that these daily operations of the federal government are also heavily, heavily funded by federal tax deposits. Uh, these are payroll tax deposits uh, from America's businesses. Okay, so as you can see here, uh, tons of money coming in. Uh, you'll notice this was uh, just a few days after the November 15th uh, monthly uh, deposit deadline. So the, uh, there's some, uh, some late deposits coming in, uh, some stragglers, uh, but it, it is still a significant uh, amount of money. So, um, you know, over $8 billion on this particular day. Uh, compared to you know just over a billion dollars in uh, uh, increased debt issues. Um, now, unfortunately, as you can see over there on the uh, withdrawal side, the uh, the the withdrawals are, are are a little bit higher than um, uh, the income. But because of the fact that these federal tax deposits are such a profound driver of treasury revenue, it stands to reason that they are very concerned about small businesses uh, making these tax deposits. So that is why the payroll tax deposits are such a huge enforcement priority for the IRS uh, through the SBSE uh, uh, division. Uh, it is time for our first polling question. Uh, this should be uh, popping up on your screen. Uh, which of the following services do you offer or advise on? Uh, bookkeeping, tax services, payroll, workers' comp. Um, what is the primary service that you uh, uh, offer and advise on? Give you a moment there, votes are roaring in. So again, if, you, if you've never taken the, the time to look at the, the Treasury daily statements, uh, I like to look at them you know, every couple months just to kind of uh, geek out on uh, the numbers that are there. Uh, and, and it's very uh, interesting to see you know, where the, the money's going during certain times of the year uh, to see what programs are, are um, uh, being funded. Uh, uh, one of the interesting things on there is you can actually, on the Treasury Daily Statement, uh, there's actually a, a, a transfer item uh, from the Social Security Trust Fund to the General Fund. Uh, so you can actually, you know, anybody at any time can look and see uh, exactly what the status of the Social Security Trust Fund is, uh, as an example. Uh, so a lot of the uh, kind of the political rhetoric that's out there in the media uh, can simply be. Uh, fact checked by looking at the Treasury Daily Statements. All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close off vote. It looks like the vast majority of folks primarily are um, offering tax services, uh, which is to be expected. So let's take a look at employer responsibilities when it comes to payroll. First of all, uh, and this is a big one, obviously, making proper determination of employee treatment. Uh, the government does not like it when a business tries to treat everybody as an independent contractor. Uh, this is something that we should all be uh, familiar with already, uh, but, it, but it's, it, it never ceases to amaze me when I work with tax debt clients uh, how many of them have done this improperly, either uh, intentionally or unintentionally, uh, for years and years. You know, uh, th there's obviously the, uh, the, the multi-point test uh, that, that's uh, kind of beyond the scope of today's presentation uh, in order to determine whether somebody's an employer or not. But what it really boils down to is whether or not the employer is uh, directing how, when, and where the worker is completing tasks. Um, that is the kind of the one sentence summation 
of the de of the definition of an of an employee. So if the employer is telling the person when to show up, where to show up, and how to do their job, then that is definitely an employee. Uh, employers are also responsible for uh, completing the proper paperwork and doing the due diligence to make sure that somebody is eligible to be an employee. So uh, obviously they have to uh, check social security numbers, they have to complete um, I-9 paperwork, uh, they have to uh, complete new hire reporting. Uh, this is something uh, that uh, is, is done at the state level, uh, but it's something that needs to be on the, you know, a, a check the box sort of thing for every employer. Uh, you have to collect a completed W-4. Uh, some employers that I have represented uh, have mistakenly believed that the W-4 was optional, uh, and it's not. Uh, it, it is part of the new hire process as mandated by the IRS, and the record keeping requirements also specifically state that the uh, W-4 must be maintained uh, uh, with the employee employee's personnel file. So uh, don't skip out on completing the W-4. Uh, the, the next two might <laughs> sound a little bit silly, uh, but again, this is also an area where I have uh, ran into some issues with uh, clients that I've represented. Uh, they don't properly track the wages of their employees. Now, again, it might sound kind of silly. Why wouldn't you track wages? You've got to pay people, right? Well, you know, if if you have only a, a couple of people and your the, the the business owner is uh, involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the business, you know, they're out in the field, they're on construction sites, they're, um, uh, they're doing actual work, you know, in the business, then, you know, little things to them that aren't important, such as tracking hours, uh, can kind of fall to the wayside. So uh, a, a business is required by the IRS. It's a requirement. They have to have a system in place to track wages. And then, of course, you actually have to pay people. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a brief story from uh, uh, my tax resolution uh, days. Uh, I, I choose to no longer represent daycares. Uh, and the reason for that is because back in 2008, 2009, when I got into uh, the tax profession, uh, obviously it was right when... Uh, the economic downturn was was happening. That's how I ended up in bankruptcy myself. That's how I ended up changing careers from real estate to um, tax. Uh, I was a real estate broker and investor and lost my shirt, you know, in the real estate crash. So um, lots of people were impacted by that. Well, so were state governments. And the interesting thing about daycares is that a lot of them rely on reimbursement from the state government for low income child care okay the the flip side of the coin is that when the state budgets are a mess well these daycare centers aren't necessarily getting paid on time every time uh, several states uh, in particular uh, i remember illinois uh, and arizona were particularly hard hit and uh, they were often six to eight months behind in paying these daycare centers, uh, you know, reimbursement for childcare for low income families. Well, uh, that obviously was not good for the daycare centers. That's not good for business when you're, you know, you're, you're um, not getting paid for that length of time. It's not good for any business, but it's particularly bad for a business that cannot lay people off because they're required by state law to maintain minimum uh, adult child ratios, okay? So these daycare centers were stuck between a rock and a hard place. They couldn't lay people off uh, without fear of losing their state license to operate a daycare. And at the same time, they weren't getting paid by the state. And for the ones where low-income families represented a significant portion of uh, their customer base, um, 
they they were just they were hosed is, is what it was and so obviously they fell behind on uh uh uh, paying uh, payroll taxes, uh, but also simply paying their staff. Uh, I, I worked with several clients that were months, multiple months behind on paying their staff. So uh, in case it, you know, your, your first reaction to the actually pay people part of the slide here uh, is, is to scoff. Well, that is a very concrete example of a situation where a business is unable to pay people uh, because of circumstances that are completely beyond their, their control. Uh, so uh, it, it didn't take me long to, to realize, you know what, I'm going to choose not to work with daycares anymore uh, because it, the, the, they obviously have a problem paying your fee as well. Um, and it can be very difficult to, to ever uh, get paid for the work that you do for them. So I, I simply chose not to work with those clients anymore. Let's take a look at uh, withholding requirements. Uh, obviously, uh, income taxes have to be withheld from uh, paychecks. And obviously, this is why we need the W-4 so that we know exactly how much uh, to withhold. Uh, employers are also responsible for withholding the employee's portion of Social Security and Medicare taxes. Uh, nowadays, we have the additional Medicare tax withholding uh, for individuals with uh, incomes above 200000 uh, and then obviously also your state withholding uh, requirements. Uh, an employee must also determine their proper deposit and filing schedules. So uh, one of the things for, for really, really small businesses with small payrolls, um, they may be interested in filing annually instead of uh, quarterly with their 941s, uh, but you must apply for permission from the IRS to file the form 944 on an annual basis instead of the quarterly 941s. Uh, 941 filers have the option of paying their taxes um, on, with the return, so on a quarterly basis if the tax is small enough, uh, and annually if they get that 944 election um, at the whim of the IRS. Now, uh, the reason I have monthly highlighted here is because the vast, vast majority of small businesses uh, that you and I work with are going to be monthly depositors. Now, the way that the deposit schedule is determined is based on a look back period. And the look back period can be a little bit complicated um, uh, to explain to a client. So this is one of those kind of value added services that I uh, recommend that you uh, do yourself. Uh, or if you're using a platform such as Gusto, they will actually do this for you. Um, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but the way that the look back period works for a 941 filer is to total up all the taxes that were reported on forms 941 for a four quarter look back period. This look back period starts on July 1st and ends on June 30th. So the for for 2015 what you're looking at is a uh, a four quarter period that starts July 1st of 2013 actually and runs through June 30th of 2014 okay that's the look back period that you're looking at now if you add up the total tax that was due for those four quarters during that look back period. And the number is $50,000 or less than your client is a monthly depositor. If it's more than $50,000, then they are going to be a semi-weekly depositor. Monthly depositors have to deposit payroll taxes for a particular calendar month no later than the 15th of the following calendar month month for a semi-weekly depositor it's based on when the payday falls 
So if a payday falls on a Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, then the federal tax deposit is due the following Wednesday. If the payday falls on a Saturday, Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday, then the federal tax deposit is due the following week on Friday. Okay? So that is something that you need to understand. The vast majority of your clients are going to be on a monthly deposit schedule. Uh, for most of us that are on this webinar, uh, a few of our clients might fall on a uh, semi-weekly schedule if they have a particularly uh, large payroll. Uh, one thing to, to point out, uh, if, uh, if you have really large clients, uh, that have uh, an accumulation of $100,000 or more in withheld taxes that are due, uh, those have to be paid basically right away. Uh, anytime you accrue a $100,000 payroll tax liability for a given period, you have to make the deposit the very next day. Okay, so that takes us to some penalties. Uh, penalties are one of the more interesting aspects of doing representation work because people don't realize how quickly these penalties can add up. The, and, and this goes back to how serious SBSE is about uh, enforcement of these federal tax deposits because they bankroll the day-to-day -day operations of the U.S. government. Okay, so the first thing you need to look at is the federal tax deposit penalty. Uh, Dan posted a question here. Yes, Dan, uh, all of these penalties are abatable uh, as long as you have reasonable cause uh, or under the first time abate uh, process. Uh, so uh, if your client has a federal tax deposit due on the 15th of the month and they don't make it on time, they will accrue a federal tax deposit penalty. Now, for the first five days, it's only 2% of the total amount due. But from day 6 through day 15, it jumps up to 5%. If it's 16 days or more late, the penalty is 10%. If, that penal, if, if the tax deposit has still not been made 10 days after a bill has been sent, you know, a, 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 a notice and demand for, for payment, then it jumps up to 15%. Okay? So these, and this is for every dime that is due on the payroll taxes. This is not just specific to say only the income tax withholding or only, uh, you know, the FICA taxes. No, this is the whole kit and caboodle, right? So if your client has, say, a $5,000 uh, tax deposit that's due, that was due October 15th, uh, and they haven't made it until, you know, sometime in November, well, it's automatically going to have a minimum of 10% additional penalty added on. Uh, and then if the IRS uh, has to issue a bill, which they'll do after the 941 has been filed, uh, then the payment jump, the, the penalty jumps up to 15% if it still hasn't been paid. So uh, be very, very careful with your clients uh, and, and make sure that they're aware that if they don't make these federal tax deposits on time, this can get really expensive really fast. Okay. Uh, they also, of course, have to file that 941. And if they don't file it, then there is a penalty for failure to file. Uh, and Susan had a question, can you pay the deposits with Form 941, the smaller client with a small amount under 1,000? Uh, the answer there is yes. Uh, if the, uh, the, the total tax due on the Form 941, if it's less than $1,000, uh, you can pay it with the return. Uh, that goes back to uh, where I was talking here about determining your, your deposit schedule. Uh, most of our clients are gonna fall on a monthly uh, some will fall on a semi-weekly. Uh, there's a few that will fall on a quarterly, and you can pay that with the return. Um, this is going to be the case for very, very, very small uh, businesses, uh, a lot of uh, Soho, you know, small office, home office uh, size uh, businesses might fall into that. 
But yeah, if, if, if the amount due on the 941 is going to be less than $1,000 for all three months of the quarter cumulatively, then yeah, they can make the payment with the 941. But what happens if they don't file? Uh, there is a significant penalty for failing to file the return. And that penalty is 5% per month, okay, with a 25% cap. Uh, but if the return is filed without a balance due, meaning all the federal tax deposits were made, they're still going to get you, all right? There is a minimum of a $135 penalty or 100% of the tax, whichever is less. So at a minimum, at a minimum, you're going to have uh, this $135 uh, or 100% of tax due penalty if you don't file on time. And remember, the 941 is due uh, at the end of the month following the close of the quarter. If the 941 isn't fully paid, there's also going to be a failure to pay penalty that is 0.5% per month with a 25% cap. And this is on top of all the other penalties that we've already talked about. So uh, the employer also has to file the unemployment tax return, uh, the, the annual form 940. And again, the same failure to file and failure to pay penalties also apply. Now, there's, there's a lot of employers that completely forget about the 940. They, it's not even on their radar. Uh, they're not even aware of it. Uh, so this is one of the things that, that should be on your checklist as their accountant for, uh, you know, double checking them and making sure that they're meeting all their responsibilities. Uh, and then, of course, we have the information returns that need to be filed, uh, W-2s, W-3s, etc. Uh, and those also have their own uh, failure to file penalties for those information returns. Uh, lastly, uh, records retention. All these things that you have to keep. Uh, amounts and date of all payments. Uh, so you have to maintain records of payments that were made to employees uh, uh, for four years. Uh, tip reporting, uh, allocated tips, uh, the fair market value of uh, in-kind wages, uh, the employee records such as name, address, what they did for you, their social, dates of employment, um, uh, absentee records, all those W-4s, all of these things need to be kept for a period of four years. And we haven't even discussed state level responsibilities. So uh, beyond just the IRS, obviously, there's also the employer responsibilities at the state level, which is a whole other can of worms. Um, uh, if, if you're not in uh, a situation, you know, I'm fortunate to be in the state of Washington where we don't have, uh, 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 you know, state uh, personal income tax. So, uh, but if you're not so fortunate, then you're going to have to deal with state responsibilities. And obviously this is far more reaching in some states than others. Uh, I'm going to throw up polling question number two here. I'm not going to take as much time. Uh, as you can tell, I like to give a lot of information and really uh, um, get rolling on stuff. So I am about three minutes behind where I want to be. Uh, so here is poll number two. To what extent do you offer payroll as a service today? Uh, I offer full service payroll. I only handle setup. I only handle payroll tax related issues and compliance, uh, which is what I do historically. Um, I refer my clients to payroll providers or none of the above. Um, uh, in in the, the past few years where I've been uh, providing uh, marketing and practice management assistance to accountants, uh, one of the things that I've heard over and over and over again is that they don't want to provide payroll services uh, because they don't think that it's profitable uh, or that it's there's too much risk involved or that it's, um, you know, uh, too much work for uh, what they can uh, uh, charge for it. So a quick question for you, Jake. How does Gusto help with managing all of these responsibilities that employers have? Yeah, definitely, Jason. Gusto, uh, really at the core of our service, it's definitely helping employers manage those responsibilities um, in many, many different ways. Uh, just to name a few, 
uh, we automatically generate and file all new hire paperwork. So when an employer hires a new employee, there are many different rules for each state uh, in terms of filing those new hire, that new hire paperwork. We automatically do that on the back end every time you add a new employee to our system. Uh, same goes with contractors. There's a number of contractors out there, or sorry, a number of contractor regulations that require the reporting of new contractors as well. If you add a contractor to our system, if a state requires that, we will also report that directly with them. Uh, in terms of you know, the different payroll tax codes out there, you know, there are 18,000 across the country. Um, it comes down to local, state, uh, federal requirements. In our system, just by putting in the company locations that you work in and the employer addresses such as, uh, or the employee address of their home and work locations, we actually use our system and the geolocation technology to determine which payroll tax uh, jurisdictional requirements you need to follow as an employer. And so we will automatically let you know which one of those that fall in, and are applicable to you in your business. And so we'll actually help you and lead you in the right direction and make sure that those things are all handled appropriately. Uh, we also help and calculate all the different uh, tax uh, amounts that you need to pay that goes along with each of those jurisdictional requirements. So we'll calculate that just based on the payroll data that you put into our system. Uh, and then once those are calculated and once uh, those are determined, we will actually automatically generate and file all of those quarterly and annual returns again, whether we're talking about 940s, 941s, um, all that different stuff. We'll do that all automatically for you. Again, it depends on the local and state requirements. There's a lot that goes into it, and our system uh, automatically determines those and files those on your behalf. Uh, so, and now the best thing about that, after we've done all of those filings and all those calculations, you can actually always access all the different forms that we file directly from your Gusto account just by logging in uh, and pulling that from the form section. So you always have that online repository there available. You always have uh, that information at your fingertips in case you ever do need to provide that documentation to any kind of um, you know, IRS agency or whatnot in the future. So definitely help in many, many different things. Um, at the end of the day, if you ever have any questions as well, all our, all our customers have access to our great customer care team here. Uh, and so the necessary support whenever you're confused or have questions is always available uh, to make things a little bit more clear. Awesome, Jake. Thanks for sharing all that. I mean, as a Gusto customer myself, those are the things that I love about your platform. You simply take care of it all so I don't have to worry about it. You take something that is so complicated and you just make it so easy for me. And, and like I said, as a customer, I definitely appreciate that. So what if a small business does not keep up on all these requirements? Uh, what if they're not making those federal tax deposits, not filing those 941s? Um, the interesting thing about uh, the SBSC uh, collections effort is, you know, they're, they're really overwhelmed. Uh, revenue officers uh, are typically... Uh, supposed to carry somewhere around 50 or 60 cases, uh, but it's not uncommon for a lot of them to have 70 or more. And they are just simply straight up overwhelmed. Okay, so uh, on average, it can take about eight quarters for a business that is continuing to accrue more and more 941 liabilities. Uh, it can take up to two years, eight quarters, for them to actually pop up on a revenue officer's radar. Okay, uh, and so basically what these businesses discover is that by not paying the payroll taxes, it's obviously good for their cash flow. Uh, and then they realize pretty quickly that nobody's coming after them right away. And so it's the proverbial, you know, uh, frog in uh, a cold pot of water and then you turn on the heat and uh, slowly boil the frog versus if you throw the frog into boiling water, he'll just jump out, right? So this is the trend that a lot of uh, businesses that get into trouble with their payroll taxes uh, experience because they don't see any initial enforcement action. Now, once a business is under 
uh, enforced collections. That means that the, the government is coming after them uh, for those unpaid payroll taxes. Uh, the question obviously is, what can they do? And as practitioners, there are tools at your disposal that you can use to go to bat on behalf of your client, okay? Now, for the most part, the same options that exist for resolving 1040 debts have counterparts on the 941 debt side, okay? Uh, there are some, some slight changes. Uh, for example, uh, the guaranteed installment agreement for uh, debts less than $10,000, that is only uh, workable on the 1040 side. That does not exist for anything other than personal income taxes. Uh, streamline installment agreements, uh, those do exist over on the 941 side um, uh, with some catches. Uh, so uh, for the most part, uh, the business uh, has to be either closed or in the process of closing uh, in order to be eligible for that streamline criteria installment agreement. Uh, regular installment agreements uh, also exist. Uh, uh, partial pay installment agreements also exist. Uh, if you're not familiar with the partial pay installment agreement, it's a very cool tool. Uh, it basically allows a business to... Um, pay on their obligations to the IRS uh, up until the collection statute expiration date. Uh, the CSED is the end of the 10-year period that the IRS has by federal law to collect on the debt. Now, a partial pay installment agreement uh, is going to require uh, the, the full rubber glove treatment in regards to the financial probing uh, that the IRS is going to conduct. Uh, that's what I mean by full financials. Uh, so there is no, uh, um, you know, just, oh, just send a P&L and we'll base your installment agreement amount based on whatever that shows. No, uh, they're going to do full asset verification. They're going to make a, uh, uh, an in-person site visit by a revenue officer to, to uh, visually verify the presence of assets, et cetera. Um, you know, make sure that the business isn't hiding, you know, a, a private jet um, uh, somewhere there in the office, right? That, that they're not uh, stating on the 433B. The uh, 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 offer in compromise option, uh, a lot of accountants don't realize that a business that is operating can file an offer in compromise, okay? OICs are not just for individuals. Uh, and oftentimes it is worth taking a look and seeing whether uh, your client qualifies for the offer in compromise instead of doing the partial pay installment agreement. Now, uh, all of these options here uh, are going to require the trust fund recovery penalty be assessed against a responsible party. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. Now, there are special installment agreement options for operating businesses with employment tax debt, uh, but because of time, we're only going to cover one of them, uh, and that's the IBTFIA. That's In Business Trust Fund Installment Agreement. Uh, so this is a installment agreement to address payroll taxes uh, that have a trust fund component. So those trust fund taxes being the monies that were withheld from an employee's paycheck. So that's the trust fund part. And the business is still operating. So it's in business trust fund installment agreement. Uh, for these types of installment agreements, there is no cap on the tax penalties and interest that can be covered by the payment plan. A 433B is going to be required, but the uh, verification process, you know, that, that full probe uh, isn't necessarily going to be required uh, if the uh, tax penalties and interest are less than $25,000 and the installment agreement is going to full pay the liability within 60 months, okay? Uh, a full financial analysis is required if you can't meet either the $25,000 or five-year mark. Uh, a lien is definitely going to be filed against the business. Uh, asset disposal, what I mean by, there, by that is if the business owns assets that have equity in them, 
uh, the IRS can require the business to either sell the asset or try to borrow against the asset uh, in order to take some of that equity, turn it into cash, give it to the IRS. Okay? The IRS can require an operating business to do that um, prior to granting the installment agreement on whatever amount of money is left over. Uh, a revenue officer is required to make a field visit to uh, make sure that the business isn't hiding assets. Uh, and there is going to be a compliance cross-check. Uh, what I mean by this is that corporate officers, uh, you know, anybody that's on, um, you know, the, the, the bank signature card, anybody that's on the articles of incorporation or articles of organization, uh, they are going to... Uh, have their own compliance check performed uh, by the revenue officer uh, to make sure they don't have any 1040 problems or if they have other businesses that they are part of that also have problems. Uh, a group manager, a GM, is required to sign off on an IBTFIA, uh, but doing direct debit of the payments is optional. Uh, the trust fund recovery penalty uh, in an IBTFIA, a 4180 interview may be conducted, but it is not absolutely required that the revenue officer holds somebody accountable for the trust fund recovery penalty. Oftentimes what will happen is the revenue officer will request that a potentially responsible individual, so an officer of the corporation, etc., uh, that they agree to extend the assessment statute expiration date. The ACED, uh, which is normally three years, is the maximum time period that the IRS has to throw somebody under the bus for the trust fund recovery penalty. Okay. So um, this is uh, pretty common in situations where um, the, uh, the IBTFIA, so the business payments, are going to full pay the liability at least one year prior to the earliest assessment statute expiration date. So in other words, usually within 24 months is usually what we're talking about there. If the in-business trust fund installment agreement is not going to pay the tax penalties and interest on the corporate debt, on the 941 debt, um, uh, in a timely manner, uh, and you notice my little note there, this is most clients, <laughs> then what you can expect is a full 4180 interview, which is the process for determining who is responsible for the trust fund recovery penalty. Um, the revenue officer is also going to request personal financial information from those potentially responsible parties. Now, a little negotiating tip for you here. This is where you can offer the 2750, which is the document that the taxpayer can sign in order to extend the time period on the, uh, that the IRS has to assess the trust fund recovery penalty. Okay? Um, in these situations, it's not mandatory for the revenue officer to obtain this ASAT extension, but you can use it as a tool to avoid the immediate trust fund recovery penalty assessment um, uh, and to, to help your client out on the personal side. Okay, so uh, also keep in mind that if your if a taxpayer has had multiple businesses with a 941 debt problem, uh, the trust fund re recovery penalty absolutely guaranteed to be assessed. Okay, um, there's no getting around that. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, this particular process, um, I, I personally believe that one of your most important internal revenue manual references that you can embrace is uh, IRM section 5.14.7.4.1. So what is the trust fund recovery penalty? Um, uh, because of time, I'm going to zip through this really, really quick. Uh, the trust fund is all monies that are withheld from an employee paychecks. Uh, and that it's called trust fund taxes because obviously that was held in trust for payment to the government. The basic process, it looks like this. There's a form 4180 that the IR, that a revenue officer 
uh, will go through with the potentially responsible person to determine if they meet all the criteria. Uh, there is the form 1153, uh, which is the proposal of the assessment against the individual based on that interview. There's the form 2751, which is what a taxpayer would sign if they're just going to accept the assessment. Uh, a, a taxpayer should never sign that form uh, without talking to one of us, obviously. Uh, and then form 2750 is that uh, extension of the IRS's ability to, um, uh, of the time period to extend that tax. Uh, it's important for both you and your client to understand that the trust fund recovery penalty is a personal assessment. Okay, it is personal. It breaches the corporate veil administratively. Okay, uh, and it is also a joint and several liability with the business. So the business still owns it and is still uh, uh, responsible for it. Uh, obviously, payments from either the individual or the business will reduce the overall liability of both parties. Uh, and even if the business closes, the personal assessment of the trust fund still stands. Uh, it's an entirely separate case, a separate debt, separate responsibility. It's a separate resolution situation. And a little bit of a revenue tip for you here. Um, uh, typically, I will charge anywhere from an additional $1,000 to $2,000 per individual person for trust fund recovery penalty representation when I'm working a tax debt resolution case. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, the trust fund recovery penalty and the 941 uh, resolution options in particular, uh, take a look at these other courses on cpesuite.com. These are available in self-study format, uh, resolving 941 tax liabilities and trust fund recovery penalty uh, assessment, willful and responsible. That one gets into defense situations uh, in particular. So now I'd like to invite Jake to give you all a brief demonstration of some of the really cool features inside of Gusto. All right, so going to kick things off here, just like going to inter introduce me to do. I'm going to give you a quick walkthrough of what the Gusto platform looks like, kind of give you guys all a high-level overview and, and let you see what it looks like in practice. So uh, my screen here that we're looking at is what we refer to to as an accountant dashboard. This is the view that if you're an accountant user in our system, so you're either uh, recommending our product to uh, clients of yours or you're actually using our system as the engine behind your payroll service for your clients, uh, you would have this, this one single login information where you'd be able to see all of your clients from one consolidated place. You'd see all your clients that are currently getting set up as well as all of your clients that are actually currently up and running uh, payroll with Gusto at the current time. See all the payroll deadlines here on the left. Very simple, easy, clean, um, simple and easy to follow there. So in order to actually start managing one of your specific clients, all you need to do is simply click on the particular company you want to look at. It takes you into what we now refer to as a single company dashboard. This is the view that any small business would have as soon as they log in. You as an accountant user would it be able to click in and manage all of your clients that you actually currently have access to. So uh, a couple things to highlight as we're going through, we've spent a lot of time trying to make payroll, um, our payroll system very simple, clean, easy to use, very intuitive. There's a lot of responsibilities that come with payroll that you're clearly listening to now and you know, we will try to make a lot of those complexities out of sight, out of mind, but also in a way that you understand your responsibilities as well. So. The most common thing that you're going to log in and do for any particular client uh, is actually run apparel. So we're going to highlight that right here up, in, up front and center with the to-do items. All you need to do is intuitively enough, again, click on that to-do item and we'll take you to this screen here that shows you all of your employees you have set up in the system, whether they're an hourly employee, a salaried employee. Uh, in order to update any hours, you just simply click in the box. You can see that the gross pay updates in real time. If you need to add any additional earnings, you just click in the respective box, as you can see here, whatever that might be, paycheck tips, cash tips, um, all relatively straightforward. You just put in the amounts you'd like into the respective box. Uh, if you'd want to control the payment method, you simply use this toggle button, whether that be paying by direct deposit, by check, or skipping a payroll altogether for this particular individual. Uh, something I would highlight is we are a paperless company, so if you did want to pay an employee by check, uh, we do have a check printing tool where you can print out a check on your own and distribute that to that respective employee. I will leave this as a check to kind of show you what that looks like in the overall process of Gusto. 
So after you've gone through and updated all this information, you would just press save and continue. You do have one last double check for accuracy purposes. You can see that here. We'll highlight everything yellow. Press it one more time. You do have the ability to also track vacation and sick days. This is a screen where for this respective pay period, you would actually update any hours taken for any respective employee. So you simply, again, click in the box, put the number in, it's going to show you the updated uh, remaining balance for that respective employee. Very straightforward. Again, very, very simple. Uh, now, something I would highlight here, we actually have a cool feature where if you actually fall into a jurisdiction where there is an employer responsibility to actually offer uh, a time off policy, a minimum, so a lot of states require that, um, we have that directly built into our system where we'll actually post a to-do item highlighting that requirement, letting you know what those minimum requirements are so that way you are fully compliant and met and meeting those standards based on where you're actually doing business. So another value add, another way to make sure you're uh, you know, running your business properly. Uh, after you've updated this, you rest save and submit one more time. Um, our system just takes a few seconds to calculate all the different tax amounts as well as what I had mentioned earlier, the different net pay amounts for anyone you indicated needed to be paid by check. So this is a net check that you would need to write and then give to this respective employee, relatively straightforward. Now, we will still handle all the taxes for this individual, it's just simply the net pay. And that really is a, uh, uh, leading to the next screen here, which is the review of the payroll we had just run. You can see uh, the summary of all the debits we'll be hitting the employer's bank account for. That includes the total direct deposit, the total employee and employer taxes, as well as any reimbursements that had been processed for this respective pay period. Um, at this point, like I kind of said, we are a full service payroll provider. And so we're going to debit uh, for these respective amounts. And then we are going to uh, then, um, we are then going to uh, impound all of the taxes for the respective um, jurisdictions that you need. And we're gonna remit those uh, as soon as they're due, as well as make all the respective filings that also need to be made for um, those respective jurisdictions. So that includes all the quarterly 940s, 941s, whatever you need, um, as well as all the local and state requirements. Um, if you ever needed to cancel the payroll, you see something that might be wrong in this, um, you just press cancel there. Um, very simple, one click, very easy to do. Um, you can see all more summary here. Very, again, very straightforward, very easy to do. Um, now, a couple other unique features that I always highlight in our system whenever I'm showing it to uh, potential customers or people that wanted to learn more about our uh, system is something that we refer to as autopilot. So you can see that here. Um, what this really is, is if you have uh, a company that is all, all, um, all direct deposit as well as all salary amounts, all you would need to do is press this button and we'll automatically pay those employees based on the pay schedule you have set up in our system, automatically impound all the taxes, as well as automatically remit all those taxes when they are due. Um, very straightforward, very easy to do. It really makes payroll out of sight, out of mind. We'll always shoot you an email a day ahead of time before it's going to be processed to make sure that you're fully aware that we are going to be running your payroll, but uh, just know it's one last thing to do on your plate. Um, very makes, makes payroll just that much easier. Um, another unique thing that I always highlight, and intuitively enough, if you ever need to manage any employee information, all you need to do is click on the Employees tab here, and you can see um, all the employee teams that you have set up in our system. But if you need to add a new employee, which is very common to uh, in a payroll system, obviously, you would just add this new employee. You then put in their first name, last name, employee address, as well as uh, the hire date, employee type, amount to pay, and then yes, email the employee requesting their details. And what this will do is actually have our system shoot an email to this employee inviting them to set up the rest of the information we'll need to process payroll for them on their own. And so from an administrator standpoint, it's a huge time-saving tool because this employee will then log in and historically the administrator would have to key in all of that person's information, their home address, their social security number, their bank information, their W-4 information. Instead, that employee is going to be able to enter that all in themselves. 
And so that includes putting in their banking routing information for the direct deposit. Uh, that includes all of that information. So you don't have to do it uh, as an administrator for that company. And really what this is an extension of is uh, what we call the employee view in our system. And so every employee that is paid through the Gusto system will get their own individual login account um, for our system as well. And so they can actually manage those details in real time. They can go in here if they move, update their address. Uh, if they uh, want to add a second bank account for direct deposit, they have that ability. If they want to change their original bank account for direct deposit, they have that ability as well. They can update their W-4 information. Um, once you do update that, we'll actually generate an electronic W-4, and that, uh, that employee actually always has real-time ability to view that right here. And you can see this little note at the top that the W-2 is not ready yet for 2015. And so really what we're saying is um, once that is available, that W-2, it will be posted right here for that employee to pull electronically online. And so for you um, as an administrator of the company, you do not have to email that employee their W-2. You don't have to mail that employee their W-2. It's all going to be available online for that employee to pull themselves. It's completely compliant from all regulatory requirements where you don't have to um, you know, worry about making sure that that employee gets that W-2 because it's directly available from their own individual login portal. Another key thing to keep in mind here is that even if you have a dismissed employee, they're still going to maintain their individual login portal. So from that standpoint, uh, there is a regulatory requirement to make sure you send off that W-2 for any dismissed employee. Now, we make that a lot easier. You don't have to track down that employee's current address or anything like that, even if you might have had let them go nine months ago. You don't have to worry about getting their current address. Instead, if they ever come back to you and say, hey, I never got my W-2, you just say, well, it's always been available online for you to pull from the Gusto system. Just use your email address and password um, that you have got set up a while back. So thanks again, Jake, for the demo. Definitely appreciate that. Um, you know, one of the things I think is uh, important to mention about Gusto is your really high rate of uh, customer satisfaction. Could you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, no, definitely, Jason. I appreciate that. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, payroll is a complex thing. I mean, I think a lot of this, uh, a lot of that we talked about today is, is kind of reiterating that. And so it can be hard to satisfy all of our customers. We've been very fortunate and uh, work really hard to make sure that we put the customers first. We've heavily invested in our customer care team. And so uh, we know that payroll can be complex as much as we've tried to use software to make things simpler, um, you know, questions come up still. And so we have a great customer care team here, um, both in our San Francisco and Denver offices, and they're always available to answer support or provide valuable support, answer questions. Uh, they'll actually communicate directly with any state, local, uh, or even the IRS, a state or local agency or the IRS, if there ever to be any kind of questions, and they'll do that communications on your behalf. And so. Um, their real goal is to make your life a lot easier, and you can see our, our NPS rating there. It's a net promoter score. It's a way to measure how happy our customers are, and um, we take a lot of pride in that. It's one of our key metrics here internally to make sure we're doing a good job, and um, you know, I think our customer care team is a big reason for that overall. Um, you can also kind of see here on the screen the, uh, the different integrations. We do integrate with a number of different software partners that also uh, leads to you know, happy customers, just in the fact that the software that you're using, whether that be QuickBooks, Xero, uh, and all that sort of thing, uh, we integrate seamlessly with those, so that way any kind of software system you're using, it's all going to play nicely. Uh, awesome. Uh, really good stuff. Uh, real quick, uh, could you just go over the uh, pricing? Uh, there are some folks in the, the chat that are uh, asking how the pricing works. Uh, so could you explain this slide real quick that explains the, uh, the customer pricing uh, plus the information uh, there on the bottom of the slide that talks about the uh, partner program uh, pricing, kind of how that works? Yeah, absolutely, Jason. Yeah, definitely. So you can see here, it's just $29 per month per company and $6 per person. What this means is it's a, a monthly charge. It's not based on the number of times you actually run payroll. You can run payroll as many times as you want. It's really based on that head count. So um, you, just run the, you just run payroll as many times as you want. It's just a monthly rate that's absolutely all-inclusive. There's no quarterly filing fee, no W-2 fee, anything like that. Um, now, you can see there on the bottom the different volume discounts, so you can go back to that accountant view I touched on, shown earlier. Depending on the number of clients you have, 
uh, you qualify for a different volume discount. You can see those there. I'm not going to go through the different numbers, but it's pretty straightforward that the more clients you add, the bigger discount you get. We also run promotions from time to time, so definitely check in with us what our, our current things are going on right now, and uh, we'll give you more information that uh, has to do with our partner program. Great. Thanks, Jake. And uh, here's contact info for the company uh, uh, as a whole. If folks want to reach out directly to you, Jake, uh, what's the uh, best way for them to reach you if they want a, uh, a private demonstration or if they want to talk about the partner program further? Uh, how can folks reach you yeah. directly? Yeah, absolutely. So all you need to do, really that information right up there is, is probably the best way. All that, the, the advisor at, that will get directly routed to uh, me or someone on my team. So or, you know, definitely get you in touch with the right person. So if you have, if you have any questions and you'd like us to um, give you a personal demo, see how our system might work with you and your clients or your firm, whatever makes the most sense, uh, please reach out. That The advisor at gusto.com is definitely a, a great source, or just give us a call directly. Uh, we'll make sure to put you in touch with the right person, whether that be me or uh, anyone else on my team. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jake. I appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your day to be here with us. And uh, thank you again to Gusto, formerly Zen Payroll, for sponsoring today's presentation. Uh, we are tied on time, so I want to go ahead and wrap up and put up polling question number three. I'm going to leave this up uh, for a, a very brief moment, so please, everybody, make sure that you get your vote in so that we can uh, get that registered in the system so you can get your certificate of completion. Uh, so I'll leave that up for just a moment. So again, if uh, you are on the phone, jump over to uh, the computer so that you can answer the polling question. I'll leave that up for just another uh, 15, 20 seconds or so here. And after today's uh, webinar, I, I would really encourage you to uh, check out Gusto's partner program. Check the, out their product for your own payroll. Uh, I'm using them in my own business for payroll processing, and I have been extremely delighted with um, how easy the setup process was and how simple it it is to actually run payroll. Literally, uh, it, it, it takes something that's complicated um, and it couldn't be any easier uh, using Gusto's platform. So I'm gonna go ahead and close down the polling question. Don't forget in order to obtain your certificate of completion, uh, you do need to have an account and a completed profile on cpesuite.com. Uh, you do have to uh, have answered all three of today's polling questions, and you have to have been logged into the system for at least 50 minutes. If you provide us a PTIN in your profile, we will report your hours to the IRS, uh, regardless of whether you're an attorney, EA, uh, RTRP, uh, CPA, etc. Uh, and all of these uh, requirements, the polling questions, the time of attendance, uh, these are, of course, per IRS and NASBA standards. So thank you everybody for being on the webinar today. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you to gusto.com for sponsoring our presentation and uh, everybody have a wonderful day. Take care.